first up on our conference uh, uh, slot this afternoon is Noelle O'Connell. Uh, she is the chief executive of our sister organisation, European Movement Ireland, and she was last year elected as vice president of the European Movement International too. A very warm welcome to you, Noelle. Uh, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you for the invite to, to speak to you today. Uh, I've, I've probably drawn the short straw, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in, in being the first speaker up after after the, the lunch hour, but I'm going to do my best uh, to uh, engage with you. And I'm delighted to be addressing EMUK's annual conference. And as Anna mentioned, I'm speaking to you today wearing a number of different hats. I'm the CEO of, of European Movement Ireland. We are your nearest neighbours, closest friends, and I'm also a Vice President of European Movement International. And EMUK is an important part of our European Movement family. And I want to reinforce and remind you of, of that message today. I would like to wish you continued success to all your members, your, your friends, your stakeholders, and to wish your incoming uh, Chairman and President, Lord Andrew Adonis, um, whom I had the pleasure of meeting in Dublin in person uh, some time ago in the world BC uh, before COVID. And we in the wider European Movement International Network are very grateful to your colleagues and uh, your EM UK national executive for the presence of Richard Morris on our EM International Board. Richard's wise insights, his commitment and his dedication are very much valued by all of us in the European Movement uh, International Network. So this session is centered around where do you go next? How do we build bridges, not barriers? And I would like to commend you on that. I think this is important and timely. Uh, Anna was mentioning to me that over 3,000 uh, people have registered for your conference today. That is truly incredible and staggering and is arguably one of the largest pro-European memberships and engagements across the wider EM network. And I think the challenge is for you is to how do, do you, European Movement UK use that international network of the wider European movement family that predates uh, the very membership and foundation of the EU. In fact, I, I'm, I don't need to remind this audience, but Ireland and the UK both joined the then EEC alongside Denmark in 1973. And your passion and your strength of feeling, it's very much needed and it must be harnessed to keep relations strong in spite of the challenges and uh, the tension perhaps that has crept into the current state of play. The best solution for despair, I think, is co constructive, practical, engaged, proactive action. So what can you do to strengthen ties, to focus and channel energies in a positive and constructive way that reinforces strong UK-European relations? I think you have an opportunity to elevate the vision because in Europe, everything is possible. We are going to be writing a new chapter, but how do we get it right? There are new, new chapters to be written in this European context. And don't forget the fact that you and your members have a crucial role to play in shaping and influencing this. In order to try and map out where we're all going possibly, um, we need to know, I think, where we've been. And we in Ireland, we have been there. I am talking to you from a country that has nine EU referenda over the years. And sometimes we had two bites of the cherry. If Brexit has shown us anything, it is the impossibility of reversing over 40 years of negative discourse against the EU in a short, short and deeply divided referendum campaign where alas, facts and truth we're not always in plentiful supply. And I respect the challenges that you are facing of grappling with the fact that just because 52% of the country voted for something, it doesn't mean necessarily that everyone in the UK voted for it, certainly not. It is important to harbor hope that there will be change. It is hard to say when, it is hard to say how. But on all things Brexit, we have got to be where we are. We may all want to be where we were pre-June 2016, but we have got to be where we are. Striving for the constructive channeling of your energies, your commitment and your hard work is going to reframe, reshape those relationships. It isn't going to be easy. And I say this as a friend, there is a lot of hurt, there is a lot of mistrust and 
relations are not where they were. But that doesn't mean we cannot strive for better and, and, and strive to create a better normal. I'm cognizant of the fact that I'm, I'm speaking to you this week um, as we mark 64 years of the signing of, of the Treaty of Rome, which founded uh, the, the then EC. We, we are all mindful of the fact that the UK and Europe, we share a common European uh, home. We all face common challenges that require common solutions. When one of us succeeds, we all succeed. And just by way of background, I'm going to provide a little bit of insight from an Irish perspective and also more across the EU, finish up by perhaps suggesting some options that I think EM UK could consider in how it goes about reshaping, reforming and influencing the future UK-Europe relationship. So we are three months on from uh, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement uh, in December just coming up to almost five years to the referendum, uh, four, four years, nine months of torturous negotiations. And I, ironically, we in Ireland are preparing to mark 50 years of membership of the EU in 2023. And Brexit, it has reminded us in Ireland of the innumerable tangible and intangible benefits of our EU membership. When we did eventually join in 1973, Looking at it from a trade perspective, we were able to diversify our exports. The UK accounted for 55% of Irish exports in 1973. Today, it is just under 10%, mainly agricultural. But despite Brexit and since December, the impact of the new reality and the new norm has been evidenced by very stark trade differentials. With the caveat of the, the transition period and the pre-December stockpiling, the Port traffic between Welsh ports and Ireland has declined significantly since January, 50% for Holyhead and 40% for Fishguard. The, this data highlights the increasing importance of the all-island economy, but of the reality of changing trade relationships east-west. But it is not just about trade, and that's important to state. Brexit has had significant and largely unwanted impacts on the island of Ireland at all levels. Our membership of the EU has been vitally important for us economically, but more valuable has been its framework of contributing and supporting peace on this island. Those challenges are very serious and Brexit has posed them and has caused them. Prior to Brexit, the common EU membership that Ireland and the UK shared helped bring down those barriers, particularly with the removal of customs control with thanks to the single market. And in the decades afterwards, relations between Ireland and the UK reached new highs, anchored by our common EU membership. And life was normal along that 300 mile border as it weaved its way through rivers, fields, roads, and even living rooms in people's houses. It sees 35,000 people cross it seamlessly each day in the world pre-COVID when travel restrictions weren't in place. But it is worth reminding us that there are more border crossings on that EU border 40 miles up the road from where I'm speaking to you today than there are in the entire EU's eastern border. And these are the complexities that are not only facing north-south relations, but east-west. The Good Friday Agreement, whilst bringing an end to the violence of the trouble, allow those in Northern Ireland to identify as British, Irish, Northern Irish, and all three were able to sit together and alongside shared EU citizenship. The role of the EU was significant in that process, as indeed was our friends across the Atlantic in the US. And it shouldn't be underestimated the support and the influence and that engagement for the US. And now that we have seen with President Joe Biden, a very Irish American president, has been crucial to this role. Brexit sadly upended what had become the removal of tensions around territory, the softening of borders and boundaries, and allowing people in Northern Ireland to live and work with whatever identity they chose. With Northern Ireland having voted 56% to remain, Brexit has created another layer and unwanted layers of divisions. And it has 
pushed front and centre issues like territory and borders, which are complicated due to Ireland sharing the EU's only land border with the UK, which is now the external border of the EU's single market. To prevent a return to a hard border on this island where people live, a trade border has been put in place in the Irish Sea between Northern Ireland and GB under the terms of the protocol. And also under the Good Friday Agreement, it is only the British government that can call a border poll if it appears likely a majority of those voting would seek to form part of a united Ireland. This topic and this conversation has gathered pace and momentum since the Brexit referendum. In European Movement Ireland's own independent poll that we have commissioned every year since 2013, last year, 32% of the respondents agreed that there would be a united Ireland in 10 years with 42% disagreeing and a significant 26% don't know. However, a Sunday Times January poll that found that 51% of the over 2000 people surveyed in Northern Ireland supported a border poll referendum in the next five years, 44% opposed and five not having an opinion. Brexit has raised many questions about the future of Northern Ireland and its impacts are being felt today and that dial is moving. Um, pa Pandora's box was reopened with the referendum. As I reminded our British friends when I was in London speaking and sharing the Irish experience of our nine EU referenda, it is impossible to reverse 40 years of negativity in a campaign of a couple of months. I respect and I recognize that the UK has always had a different and unique relationship with the EU than we in Ireland have. For us joining a union with 27 member states, it's about sharing and pooling our sovereignty in order to enhance it. For us, it's not binary. The EU has been vitally important for us economically, but more valuable has that it has been the contribution to peace on our island and that shared solidarity it has exhibited during the entire very difficult and challenging Brexit negotiations process. And despite those endless rounds of negotiations, the EU, its institutions and the member states, all of them stood shoulder to shoulder with Ireland. And that has not gone unnoticed or unappreciated by the people in Ireland. Again, our Ireland in the EU poll in response to the statement as to whether Ireland should remain a part of the EU, the cumulative average since 2013 saw 89% of respondents agreeing with this. Paradoxically, last year, it was the high, one of the highest at, at over uh, 93%, a Brexit, a Brexit dividend. But we must heed the lessons of Brexit. We cannot let the forces of populism, of short-termism, risk the gains and the benefits and the solidarity for the greater good collectively. And I say this to you as a friend, Perhaps bar on your side of the Irish Sea, there is a marked and pronounced underappreciation and overestimation of how much time other member states, other countries on the other side of the channel and in Brussels spend thinking about Brexit. And they also speak and understand pretty good English. The bandwidth has narrowed. There were bigger and more urgent challenges facing the EU before the pandemic has made everything more difficult and more challenging. Internal tensions over budgets, fiscal transfers, the rule of law, and the, the strategic dilemma and challenges of migration control, the climate emergency. It has been a long time since June 2016, and as that Brexit process played out, the priority had turned towards bringing Brexit to a final resolution, albeit a resolution that was primarily, as can be appreciated and understood, that was in the interests of, of the EU to ensure it, it, that its member states, and particularly Ireland, were not excessively impacted by the effects of Brexit. And the emergence of the pandemic has become, understandably, the number one priority. The realistic assessment by the EU that the period ahead would be difficult and that task of building a comprehensive and mutually beneficial future relationship on the foundations of a hard fought and a hard won agreement is not, and as we have seen, it has not been easy. Trust has been undermined, specifically in relation to the internal market bill. And whilst that may elicit some short-term domestic political gains, 
we know and we must recognize that the fact remains the EU and the UK must have a coherent and cooperative working relationships on so many issues as we build towards the future. And I, I think as David McAllister reminded you, there is another important point to remember. The EU has not yet ratified the trade and cooperation agreement with the European Parliament still needing to do that. Bandwidth is a challenge. The EU has the pandemic. We are beginning to launch a conference of the future of Europe. The German elections in September will see Ch uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel leave politics after 16 years. The upcoming French presidential elections. I could go on listing other issues, but the key point is there is a huge amount of challenges facing the EU at the moment and the UK relationship. It is a priority, but it is not the sole priority. It is not item one on the agenda. In Ireland, we are more optimistic. We place high importance on our bilateral UK relationship and we recognize and we are going to be striving to work for a productive and mutually beneficial relationship between the EU and the UK in the interest of both parties. And we see ourselves as being in that position of facilitating that process, even if it does take some time. But we are clear in Ireland that our future lies within the EU. And a bit like Monty Python in the life of Brian, we haven't yet had the proper chance to analyze what the UK ever did for the EU, quite a lot. Relief, reluctant acceptance at finalizing the divorce and the need with getting on with other things has meant that we haven't had the, challenge, the chance to look at what we will miss with the UK no longer a member. Smaller member states, Ireland primarily, used to rely and depend on the UK championing openness, less protectionism, pragmatism, your expertise, and removing the UK voice at the seat at that table means that the conversation and the inputs will be, not, will, be, will be different and not the same. And we must look at the recovery from the COVID pandemic. Congratulations, the UK is absolutely uh, playing a blinder, as we would say, in terms of its vaccine rollout, and it, you are to be commended. But what we equally have seen is that we cannot allow vaccine nationalism to take hold. We are in a race and, a, and a, a battle to save the human race, not a row to save face over, over vaccines and the, the speed of rollout. The population of Ireland is, is, is less than the combined population of the two cities of Birmingham and Manchester. Um, so the challenges of us being able to procure vaccines, um, we would not have had the same economic heft as a large country like the UK or Germany or France would have population size-wise. Vaccines, it's not a lose-lose because when we succeed, we all succeed. And the EU is important in that regard. Um, for the future, I would say to you in terms of the conference and the future of Europe, for you and the UK, EMUK, you have an opportunity to, to capitalize on your goodwill, expend capital, engage, forge a new path, work harder to make your voice heard, use that conference on the future of Europe. You are a great country. We are friends and allies, we always will be. You have an opportunity to reframe the new relationship and rest assured that your friends in Ireland, despite all the ups and downs, despite all the challenges, the bluster, the noise and, and the frost that on occasions permeates the relationship, please know that we will always keep a candle lit and light on for our UK friends. Thank you so much, Noel, for that um, important, important contribution.